So this Sunday just gone was the Daytona 500. Although it actually wasn't 500 miles because of the green and white checker rule, so your 500 mile race suddenly becomes 530. I don't get it. But then again, I can't really talk since my beloved touring cars add laps onto the races whenever the safety car comes out. But Daytona since 2001 has always had this aura of sadness around it, because it was here, at this track, that one of, if not the greatest driver in NASCAR history was killed. And the death of this driver caused several changes not just in NASCAR, but around the world. And that death involved Dale Earnhardt Sr. Now Dale was, to put it into a context Europeans might understand, was not unlike Michael Schumacher. Seven titles, a record that is shared with another driver, well, two in Dale's case, and was utterly ruthless on the track. He wasn't called the Intimidator for nothing. And seeing a good wrench Chevrolet coming up behind you must have been like seeing a white and day glow red McLaren with a yellow helmet in the 80s, or a red Ferrari with a red helmet in the early 2000s, or a black Mercedes coming up behind you in 2020. That feeling of, <laughs> I'm in danger. But that said, unlike Senna and Schumacher, who won Formula One's Crown and Jewel event multiple times, more than five, Dale only won the Daytona 500 once in his career. So for someone as uneducated on NASCAR as me, that seems a bit, well, a bit odd. Unlucky, or is it really that hard to win? Answers on a postcard, please. Anyway, for the 2001 edition of the Daytona 500, NASCAR had originally planned to run a modified version of the restrictor plate that was due to be run at the 2000 race at Talladega. But Earnhardt, among others, had complained to the media that doing this was sterilising the sport and making it so the cars could no longer race in the name of safety. In response, NASCAR changed the aero package so they could still race closely and overtake if need be. Now that 2000 race at Talladega would be Earnhardt's final ever win. So coming into the 2001 Daytona 500, it was going to be the big kickoff for the new NASCAR season. And NASCAR and IMSA are quite unique in a way in that they seem to be the only motorsports, if not the only sports as a whole, that start with their main event. In snooker, the World Championship is at the end of the season. Monaco is in May. Indy is in May. The FA Cup final is the last game of the English football season. Super Bowl final game of the NFL season. And so on. NASCAR and IMSA start with a bang. And Earnhardt's performance throughout the run up to Daytona hadn't been going to plan. He did participate in the Rolex 24 and finished fourth overall with second in class, but he didn't win the shootout, and he didn't win the 125 mile qualifying race, a race he'd won every year in the previous decade. The shootout was won by Tony Stewart, and the twin 125 by Sterling Marlin. Now despite not winning the sort of support races, the intro races, the qualifying races, whatever they're called, Dale was a front runner in the actual main event. He led 20 laps and was a front runner throughout the entire thing. And despite NASCAR having a bit of a reputation as being an absolute carnage fest, over here at least, there are only two yellow flag periods. One was on lap 49, and one was on lap 157. On lap 173, Dale was back in 7th, and basically playing rear gunner for the other drivers in the Dale Earnhardt Incorporated team. One car, driven by Michael Waltrip, who is the younger brother of Daryl, Mr. Boogity 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 himself, and the other was a car driven by Dale's son, Dale Jr., but then the big one happened, wiping out something like 18 cars. Jason Leffler, Steve Park, Rusty and Kenny Wallace, Jeff Gordon, Robbie Gordon, the Labonte brothers in Bobby and Terry, Mark Martin, Tony Stewart, Elliot Sadler, Jeff and Ward Burton, Jerry Nado, John Andretti, Buckshot Jones, Dale Jarrett and Andy Houston. All eliminated. Well, one of them was able to get back into the race. But because it was such a big accident, they had to red flag it. Now during that red flag period, Dale had said to Richard Childress, who owned the car that Dale was driving, Richard, if they don't do something about these cars, they're going to kill somebody. And before that, on the caution that happened prior to the red flag, the last conversation between Dale and his crew chief occurred. Dale's last words to him was something to the effect of, cheers, talk to you later, when the crew chief said, just keep doing what you're doing. So the laps start getting ticked off. 20 to go, 10 to go, 5 to go, and Waltrip and Junior are out in front, with Sterling Marlin leading a few laps too. Senior managed to get himself up to third. He then started playing rear gunner a bit harder to ensure his two cars got out ahead and took the win. And this is where the crash happened. Because of NASCAR being mostly on ovals where the banking can get pretty steep, like at Daytona for instance, cars can run different lanes to try and overtake and preserve tyre life. If you've watched Nibon 5 or Empty Box or GP Laps do oval stuff in simulators, you might have seen them do it there. And if you watch oval stuff on the regular, you'll know this tactic. 
Dale was in the middle of the three lanes, if you want to call it that, and was blocking Marlin in any way possible. Marlin's front bumper was carrying some damage because he'd made contact with Dale several times while trying to get past him. On the final lap, Dale was still in that middle lane. I'm assuming so he could block left or right as needed, the sort of thing they stopped the F1 drivers doing after Max Verstappen was caught doing it at Spa one year. He'd got Marlin below him, Schrader above him, and Rusty Wallace behind him. Earnhardt and Marlin made contact. Whether this was from Dale blocking or just getting that little bit of a tap in those close quarters, I mean, I've watched it a hundred times and can't decide either way, and then crossed in front of Schrader as his Chevrolet shot upwards to the outside wall as he tried to correct the slide, as it were. What is a key part of this, though, is that the secondary contact put the number three into the wall at a specific angle, called the one o'clock hit. Despite not actually tagging the wall with the rear of the car or even being hit in the rear, one of the Chevy's rear wheels came off. So the number three and the number 36 slid down the banking into the infield where they came to a stop and Schrader gets out of his car to see if Dale's all right because Dale hadn't got out of his car yet. And it wasn't until 2011 that Schrader finally admitted that he knew that Dale was gone. But at that time, he didn't want to be the person that said Dale was gone. It was a bit like the Jim Clark situation in 1968 or even Ken Block at the beginning of this year. Dale can't be dead, he's Dale. Jimmy couldn't have been killed in a racing car. Jim Clark was too good for that. I mean, how is Ken Block gone? The dude's invincible. Ahead of the accident, Waltrip crossed the line to win the race, with his brother up in the Fox commentary booth being very emotional about it. But the thoughts were with Dale, and later on the sport became very emotional. And Waltrip's Daytona 500 win would forever have this dark shadow hanging over it. The biggest day of your racing career, and it's forever associated with something else. What happened to Dale? The crash looks so unassuming, a little bit like Senna's at Imola in 1994, the sort of thing that any other time someone would have popped the steering wheel off and just walked away. Well, the cause of death was determined to be a base on a skull fracture, the same thing that killed Roman Ratzenberger the day before Senna was killed and had killed three NASCAR drivers in the last eight months. According to the post-mortem, several factors added up. The angle of the car hitting the wall had been a big part. It had caused the car to slow down much faster than it otherwise would have. But there were also several things inside the car that had also contributed. Number one being the loose straps not holding Dale in properly. One of the straps loosened completely, and as a result Dale had hit his head off the steering wheel and then gone back into his seat, something that happened to Senna in his crash, although Senna was strapped in, in inverted commas, properly. He was also wearing an open-faced helmet that had tilted forward in the accident that exposed the back of his head, so when he hit the seat, the damage was a lot more severe. There is a documentary narrated by Tiffany Dell about safety in motorsport, and the Earnhardt crash is part of it. I'll leave a link in the description. At the time of the other deaths in NASCAR, the makers of a wraparound head restraint were begging NASCAR drivers to wear this new device because they were 100% certain that this device would save the lives in a crash and would have saved the lives of the other three NASCAR drivers that had died in the run-up to this particular crash. But none of the drivers were going to wear one, because Dale wasn't wearing one. There is a portion of that documentary where a journalist is recalling a press conference where Dale referred to this wraparound head restraint called the hands device as that damn noose, because he thought that this thing was going to hang him in his car rather than save his life. And Dale says something like, I've got all my stuff rigged up how I like it, and I've crashed a million times, and I've not been killed. And all this journalist can think was, yet. As explained, that device is called the hands device. Now I can speak from experience wearing one as I got to wear one at a track a few months ago. They are a little uncomfortable. They can feel very restrictive because, well, you can't turn your head. But when you hit the brakes and your head doesn't go flat to the floor or flop over completely in the corners, it's actually very useful for someone as, well, I mean, look at me. Formula One had been researching this device or its own version of this device as early as 1996, as the FIA was on its biggest ever safety crusade following the Imola 1994 weekend. And just like after Senna's death, fans got emotional, to the point of wanting to apportion blame. Sterling Marlin received death threats in the post, while Bill Simpson, whose company of the same name made the seatbelts Dale was wearing, resigned over the crash as the emotional Earnhardt fans were blaming him and his products for being the cause of his death. NASCAR later did its own investigation into the crash and found that the seatbelts did fail, but would not go into any details over the modifications and whether they played a part, 
and would also not listen to requests from Simpson's lawyers to say that the seatbelts in the cars were up to the highest standards possible. By the next race, all but a couple of the drivers were wearing the hands device. At the end of 2001, it would become mandatory. Formula One wouldn't make the device mandatory until 2003 as the FIA had completed its research. IndyCar had it in place on ovals in the 2001 season, meaning that Formula One was behind NASCAR and IndyCar in the safety innovation. But it wasn't just motorsport law that changed. Florida law changed as well. Up until 2001, post-mortem reports and images were publicly accessible documents in Florida. Dale's widow, Teresa, was able to block the details being made public through the courts, and in a later trial, the ability to obtain these images and documents under a freedom of information type request was deemed unconstitutional, and all releases of the information now have to be done with the express consent of the deceased next of kin. On top of this, NASCAR and IndyCar put money into researching the safer barrier, a type of retaining wall designed to spread out the impact of a car hitting the wall and reducing injuries as a result, a wall that was first installed at Indianapolis in 2002 and then installed in many places thereafter. NASCAR would also develop the Car of Tomorrow, which evolved into the Gen 6 design for 2013. NASCAR hasn't had a death since. So then, a look at the death of Dale Earnhardt and how his death sparked an acceleration in safety not just in NASCAR and IndyCar, but also around the entire motorsport world. Because now, everybody is wearing one of these hands devices. Do you remember that race? Are you a massive Dale fan who watched it in complete shock because, well, it was Dale? Leave any sort of memories and things like that down in the comments and get a discussion going. I know it's not an opinion piece, but I like to hear people's memories on it. Well read them anyway. Massive thanks to the kind folk of Patreon for the continued support and if you want to help out with the image buying and other stuff like that you can join in by hitting the link in the description where there's also links to Discord and to my socials. Obviously like and subscribe and all that stuff too. And there's also super thanks down there as well if you just want to give me a small tip. So until next time I've been Aidan Maud, have a great day wherever you are and I'll see you all again soon for another video where I'll hopefully be a bit better. Stupid cold. Goodbye.